I'm Alexandra Kokora Kravitz. I'm the Magisterial District Judge in the Greater Pittston area. I'm in my eighth year in that position and I'm running for Luzerne County Judge. I'm a native of uh, Luzerne County, born and raised in DuPont, continue to live there with my family. Um, and it's really been an honor uh, serving in this capacity um, for the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania as an elected judicial official, um, as a Magisterial District Judge. And that's why I'm running for County Judge. I want to be able to bring that um, plethora of experience to the county bench. Uh, one of the things I've noticed in this race, and this isn't just your race, but it's really common, especially when, when someone's running an open judicial seat. Um, you know, we see endorsements by police organizations. I know at least you got uh, a few of those, at least in the primary. Um, but as a judge, you're kind of expected to be even-handed in dealing with all the parties involved. Does that kind of close relationship with the police kind of raise a question of, of uh, you know, possible bias no. in a judge? No, you're not expected to be. Your job is to be neutral. <laughs> That's the job of a judge. Mm -hmm. um, I think endorsements. Um, I think endorsements speak to your record, which means a record of good judicial temperament, hearing both sides of the cases, making a fair and sound decision. I mean, not. Not one side wins all the time, you know, and not everybody leaves the courtroom happy, but if they leave satisfied that their argument was, was heard clearly, um, that they were able to articulate it, um, and that I was receptive to hearing those arguments, that they were treated fairly, that they were treated with respect, that my temperament was even keeled, then that's the job of a judge. Um, I'm proud of those endorsements, don't get me wrong, because I think it, um, I think it just reinforces you know, my ability to continue to do the job in the way that I'm doing it. Um, but it absolutely dictates your impartiality. That's, that's what a job, that's what a judge is. And you shouldn't expect anything else. With your experience in, in criminal law, I know this opening is probably standard for family court. Um, from your perspective, um, how will diversionary programs working in, in the courts as they are now? And would you like to see them expanded? Do you think they go too far? Or? No, they're fantastic. I think they need to be expanded in all aspects. Um, so let me just back up a little bit, if I can. My entire judicial, excuse me, my entire legal career has been spent in a courtroom. So um, right after law school, I was fortunate enough to be hired by Lackawanna County. And in that capacity, I worked in the family court division strictly. So I worked for a um, judge, I was a clerk for a judge, writing opinions in custody cases. And then I was appointed a special master actually hearing preliminary custody determinations and child support matters. So I feel really comfortable in the family court realm. Um, that being said, in the magisterial capacity, uh, you know, we have everything. We have every criminal matter that starts in my jurisdiction. We have civil cases up to a jurisdictional limit of $12,000, so that's small claims court. We have landlord-tenant actions. We're the original jurisdiction of all landlord-tenant actions that occur within the jurisdiction of the magisterial district court. And we have traffic court. We also have night court, or duty court, as you guys know, which are arraignments. Um, we rotate through central court, which is all preliminary hearings throughout the county. <laughs> emergency PFAs, so we also deal with domestic violence issues. Um, that array of experience has allowed me to really hone in on the fact that we are not a one-size-fits-all court. We are a court that has evolved probably within the last two decades um, throughout the unified judicial system of Pennsylvania, really to adapt to treatment-based approaches in in necessary realms, whether that be substance abuse issues, veterans issues, um, mental health issues, which is a huge one, and we can expand on that in, in a variety of ways, and we should, we absolutely should. Um, as you know, our prisons are overflowing. Um, you know, there are plenty of people that do not need to be incarcerated, but judges often find themselves without another path to take in the sense that 
people are suffering from mental health issues, homelessness, substance abuse issues, and we try to address that through treatment-based programs, and I would wholeheartedly welcome um, being able to do that as a county judge. I think it's fantastic, and we have the resources to do it um, in terms of models throughout the Commonwealth, um, even landlord-tenant capacity. I mean, the Philadelphia Municipal Court, based on um, the you know COVID restrictions through a moratorium um, you know, that, that we all experienced through the Commonwealth over the COVID um, crisis had developed a, a, a program wherein they were, you know, requiring uh, pretrial conferences for evictions. I mean, these models exist throughout the Commonwealth. They exist throughout, throughout the country. And um, we'd be remiss not to take a look at some of those things where we can expand services through the court system. Yeah, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to um, also kind of redevelop the way we handled truancy when I got in, in, into district court. Oftentimes what was happening, and you know, just a little bit of background is families would miss school. Families, I say children, but the parents are often cited depending on the age of the child. People would <clears throat> miss school. I would get a citation months later. You know, what, what do you do with a child that has missed school? from September and I'm looking at the case in January. So I kind of took a, a, a global approach to that and looked at it and said, listen, I can rework my schedule here. I'm in court all the time. Let me pick a day or two days every month to already set out either pretrial conferences for truancy hearings or hearings and let me do them at the school where the families know where they're going, where they're familiar and all the stakeholders involved are only you know, a phone call away, whether that's guidance, teachers, um, you know, anybody really. Um, and that really worked. I mean, so if I'm hearing truancy cases and the third or fourth week of September because families didn't get there in the beginning of the year, we can revisit those cases. And I do. I often review those. So there's, and, and um, at the Common Pleas level, Judge Rogers has been absolutely instrumental in developing the truancy court program. So whereas it used to just stop, like stop at us and we'd either dismiss the case or find families guilty and the idea isn't really to assess a penalty and collect money I mean that's it doesn't solve the problem in other words she instituted a method where we would bridge that gap and for the more egregious cases we are able to refer them to a truancy court level where she has significant um, resources to be able to get more people involved more resources involved more agencies involved if it's a chronic issue with the family and then the same thing goes on my end so if i'm reviewing those cases and there's improvement i'm able to dismiss them without a record you know which also helps too so that's a diversionary program that we kind of developed um, just out of a need basis and, and reviewing how we had been doing it and how we could improve it but yeah there's room for all kinds of things like that absolutely Okay, from, from your service in Central Court, I mean, I, I know that's something that the county had and kind of didn't have and then brought back again. Um, how do you see that system working now? Is it been an improvement? Does it, uh, you know, get cases to the system faster or? Sure. Well, let me just first by saying I was not a part of the first central court system. So that was prior to my tenure. Um, so I've only ever worked in this central court, which started in 2017. Um, and I, I started right at the beginning. I was at one of the first meetings um, when it was then Judge, um, President Judge Hughes had talked about it, um, developing it with uh, the now current President Judge, Judge Vogue, who was the head of the criminal division at that point. So. Yeah, I think all the stakeholders came in and tried to work together to centralize that system so that everyone participates. Now, is there room for improvement? Sure. I mean, I would you know, love to see some kind of central booking system. I think that that would help our smaller departments tremendously in terms of having everybody at the same location. Well, then you got to go get a fingerprint order. Well, that's not helpful. If we have everybody there, we can, we can achieve that kind of thing there and, and, and not waste valuable time. It has definitely helped in the flow of cases. Um, we've eliminated um, some extra steps for informal appearances. We've um, streamlined some of the paperwork there, and we've rotated judges through there. So we're all kind of handling an even amount of cases. So you know, there's always room for improvement for everything. I think you know, certainly nothing's perfect, but yeah, it's working, um, and I think it's definitely helping with the backlog of the cases, criminal cases, I should say.
So we may have uh, asked this question before, but usually these assignments are not uh, permanent. I mean, judges rotate in oh, okay. different divisions. Sure. Um, given a choice, I mean, what kind of court would you rather preside? I mean, <laughs> I, I've not really thought about that, frankly. Um, I really haven't. All I can say is that I've you know, not to reiterate my previous answer, but I started in family court. I worked there for five years. I've been here for eight years, and I've gone over, you know, what MDGs do, which is basically every other jurisdiction that's at the county level. Um, and I, I, I mean, I just, I love being a judge. I'm the only judge running for judge, and I have that experience across the board, so it's not really a preference. I'm happy to serve wherever I'm assigned, frankly. Pick one of your kids. I mean, come on, I don't know. <laughs> it's like say, which kid do you? You know, I don't know. I'm not. I'm happy to serve where wherever. Should I be lucky enough to uh, be selected by the voters? You mentioned you'd be the only judge running for judgment. Do you think that gives you a unique advantage? I guess or a unique perspective, maybe. I, I don't know about advantage, but I would certainly say perspective. Um, absolutely. Experience, experience, experience. Yeah. Um, I mean, our caseload is, I mean, extraordinary. Pittston District Court is just a little microcosm of Luzerne County. I serve in a third class city, all the surrounding boroughs, eight police departments, including the Pennsylvania State Troopers. We have um, large retail, fat, or retail uh, stores, which, you know, generate you know, all kinds of things, traffic, uh, you know, some criminal matters. Um, I have, I have the turnpike, I have 81, we have 315. <laughs> um, you know, we have, a, we have a lot, we have a lot going on there in the greater Pittston area. And, you know, all of those departments run their own, run their own jurisdictions too. So it, it makes for a pretty hefty caseload. In addition to Central Court, which I served every week for two years. So now, I'm, now we're on an every other week basis. It's called it. But. And duty. We're on duty every couple of weeks, too. So. Just to kind of stay on the political questions. Sure. Um, you know, you're facing two people with pretty big name recognition. Someone who's been a DA, someone who's been a state representative for many years. Um, and I think we maybe touched on this before the cameras were rolling, but how do you uh, kind of match that or meet that in, in running this campaign? Listen, all I can do is focus on myself at this point. Um, you know, the idea is to, in, to make sure that people understand what I'm bringing to the table. And what I'm bringing to the table is that kind of experience, that judicial experience, that um, day in, day out, being a judge experience. I mean, you don't just stop at, you know, 4 o'clock or 4.30. I mean, I get called out in the middle of the night when something serious happens. Um, you know, if there's a woman or a male that's in a serious uh, domestic issue and they need an emergency PFA, I'm getting called. If there's a serious criminal matter where there's an arraignment, I'm getting called. If there's a search warrant, I'm getting called. If I'm on duty, that goes throughout the county. Um, you know, so it's not just about name recognition. It's about bringing something behind that. You know, what does that mean? Well, I am who I am. I'm, this is my job. This is what I've been doing. And, you know, that's what I'm hoping to bring to the table. But yeah, it's reinforcing your message and it's reinforcing your name to make sure that people get out and vote. Um, how much money have you raised from the campaign and have you accepted contributions from lawyers? So, uh, a total dollar amount I actually don't have off the top of my head. I try to keep a firewall. So there is a, well I do keep one. There's a finance committee um, and they raise money on on our behalf, on my behalf, on behalf of the campaign. Judicial candidates are prohibited from soliciting or accepting any cam campaign contributions directly. So I don't particularly take a close look at that because it's not my job, it's not my focus. Um, and to answer your question, yes, I mean, uh, lawyer contributions are legal and accepted and, you know, I do believe that, you know, most campaigns accept them. And we have. How will you deal with that in the case of you're sitting on the bench, a lawyer appears in front of you who you know, 
has contributed, or maybe that's true and you can tell me on the other side knows that also. Sure. How do you handle that? Uh, yeah, well, I think the best way to answer that question is to just look at my record. I mean, I've handled that. I've had, you know, attorney contributions back in 2013, and I've had a record of being fair and neutral to anybody that comes in front of me, whether they donated previously or not. It's not my job. And I think, you know, most, not most, all lawyers, lawyers are officers of the court. They are not donating to judicial campaigns to produce any kind of influence. I, I really do believe that. I mean, that's not what the purpose of that is for. Um, I think it's for making sure that we have good judges on the bench, that they understand that whomever they're contributing to is because they believe that person's just going to give them a fair shake. And that's what they should expect. What do you do in the case, though, of perhaps an attorney who hasn't contributed, and I think we've seen this in some cases, maybe an out-of-town attorney who notes that contribution oh. and asks you to refuse? I mean, I've recused myself in cases if I need to, if I think it's necessary. Um, you know, I don't want to bring any kind of impropriety or even an appearance of impropriety to a case. Um, I'm not beholden to any one case particularly. My, my personal skin isn't in the game in any case. So if there's a reason to recuse myself and it's valid, I don't have an issue with that. The, um, I don't know if you'll even answer this one, but one of the, uh, it's a bad way to preface the question, but you know, one of the things that we've talked to one of your opponents about is, is uh, Stephanie Salvantis in the handling of the Mackey case in the prison, um, and the decisions that she made in that case. Did you pay attention to that case? Do, do you have an opinion on how it was handled as to whether the DA should have, you know, maybe referred that out? Let me say this, I have no personal knowledge of that case. Um, I certainly don't have any personal knowledge in a professional capacity, nor in just being a regular citizen. I mean, obviously I've, you know, read it in the paper. I've, I've um, you know, seen all of the articles and everything. Um, and I think, you know, it was obviously a tragedy, um, you know, in terms of, of the death of anyone, really, um, but particularly in that case. And that's kind of the extent. And, that I'm going to get into that because I just I don't have any personal knowledge of it. Have you considered uh, staffing? Should you be elected? Uh, I think there's usually three three people who uh, can be hired. I have a couple of no to go. You, <laughs> not, 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 no. Nobody sent you any resumes yet. No. 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 How about the people who work for you now? I have a wonderful staff, um, and you know, you're only as good as your staff, really. I mean, we talked about how busy that courtroom is, and I'm beyond grateful for the people that are in that office, because if we don't run it well, everyone suffers. <laughs> the litigants, the judge, everybody waiting, um, so they are, they are uh, I have to give them a little, little kudos here. They're there day in, day out, but no, I really haven't given them any help. As you said, judicial candidates are not allowed to solicit directly though you can, within the election cycle, go to political events. So sure. Have you been doing that, and what kind of events have you yes. been going to? I'm going to everything. <laughs> <laughs> I have been going to everything. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. Uh, you really are, and I'm not a politician. I mean, judges are not politicians, and nor should they be. I mean, their job is too important to engage in anything like that. It's not their job to legislate from the bench. It's, you know, none of that. And I've had the... Uh, the, you know, the opportunity for the last seven years prior to this uh, to basically be living under a rock, and that's my job. <laughs> so you kind of have to come out a little bit and uh, start going to everything, and you're not going to pick and choose. If someone invites me to something, I'm going. If it's on my calendar and I can make it, I'm going. Um, the more people I meet, the better off I am in terms of uh, making sure I'm connecting with voters. And COVID really proved to be a very difficult hurdle in the springtime. We weren't able to do those things. So, you know, wear myself thin until November 2nd.
Speaking of COVID, I guess, how, how did you, I know it's created a, we talked to Judge Rowe the other day, and he said that we're kind of pleased it's created a pretty, it did create a pretty large backlog. backlog. One yeah. Uh, how have you handled that, that here at uh, Majesty Road Control? We just got back to work. Yeah. We just got back to work. We had to. Um, you know, obviously, we're operating under a judicial emergency. Our, our, our operations were shut down, you know, obviously not not to our doing, um, but for the safety of everyone. And we just got back to work. We just got back to, you know, stacking the schedule and making sure cases are heard. I think we're pretty pretty back to normal where we were. Um, just scheduling, just getting back in action. You know, our court is, is a very transactional court. I mean, we're not we're not complex civil matters where we can kind of put everybody on Zoom or anything like that. Um, you need people there. You need people to show up for their traffic cases. You need people to show up for their landlord-tenant matters. Uh, so it was just kind of on pause, and now we're back in full steam ahead. Mm -hmm. Having worked as a judge and been in the system for a while, are there any judges either in this county or other counties that you kind of see as models for temperament or uh, you know, the way they handle a courtroom sure. that you would emulate? So I've, I just feel like I'm in a, a unique position. <laughs> My first job was to clerk for a judge and um, I remember specifically I was a second year law student coming home for the summer and you know your professors are like you have to have some experience you get you, you have to put something under your belt so I, I called everywhere um, including our courthouse here and no we don't have any room no we don't have any room no we don't pay um, so then I moved to Lackawanna County you know started calling people and um, Judge Tom Munley was the only one really that answered the phone he said well I can't pay you but if you want to come and sit with me I'm, I'm happy to do that and I did and um, I sat with him that whole summer and then I after uh, I graduated law school and I took the bar exam. He had an opening in his office and he hired me and I was really fortunate to watch how he worked. Now, that being said, um, I became close with him. So, it, you know, he really was a role model for me um, in that aspect. And then I ran for magistrate um, and I won and I was fortunate enough to win. And then I had all these wonderful colleagues as magisterial district judges and I got to see how they operated their courtrooms. So, you know, that's been a tremendous experience for me. And then also, I get to see our county judges as well, or through central court. My cases go to a specific uh, judge. You know, we all kind of work together. So I can't just pick one because I really do have a nice relationship with everyone, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, and everybody brings something different to the table. They really do. Um, your personality, your temperament, your desertion and decision making—it all makes a difference. It, you know, and they're all unique in their own ways.